welcome to Piano Teaching Success Q&A. I'm Gillian Erskine and together with my colleague Paul Myatt, we've created this program so you can get answers to your questions. Let me introduce our panel for, with us today. Glory uh, St. Germain, who joins us from Winnipeg in Canada. Glory is founder of Ultimate Music Theory and is known throughout the world for her theory books and teacher training courses. Welcome, Glory. Well, thank you so much, Gillian. It is wonderful to be here all the way from Canada joining you today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like 8 p.m. there or something, or is it 9 p.m. or something? Yes, it's 8 p.m. here. You are in the future. You are in the future. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Welcome, Karen Eastman. Karen is a multi-instrumentalist and examiner and experienced piano teacher with an interest in early childhood and special needs and is well used to teaching online uh, having been taught in this environment for five years. Welcome, Karen. Well, thank you. Great to be here. I got forced into this online teaching because I moved to the country. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Karen lives in Bouval, in, which is in... Buna. 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 <laughs> um, Paula Melville-Clark is a pianist, adjudicator, accompanist and piano teacher. Paula is well known for her work in Velcros having taught in England, France and Hong Kong and having been a lecturer at the USQ, Paula is now based in Toowoomba in Queensland where she has a busy studio. Welcome Paula. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. I love your work. This uh, once a week um, uh, video that you're doing is just great. So helpful bringing all us teachers together. Oh, thank you so much Paula. Well, like we do each week, we're going to kick off today's show by visiting each of our panellists in their own studio. So you can see their setup and maybe ask any questions you have about what they're doing. So let's start with Glory in Glory's studio. Glory, would you like to take us through what you're doing? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, um, this is my studio. I teach online as well as in my piano studio where I have my grand in the other studio. But right now I'm teaching online, as you can see by my great setup. Um, I teach private uh, piano lessons and group theory club classes. And I also teach uh, teachers in our Ultimate Music Theory certification course uh, and the Elite Educator program. So I love teaching online because we have people from all over the world in our program. So it's really great to connect with everyone that way. Yeah. So I can see you've got a really great big screen there. <laughs> yes. Yes. And a circle light so you can look good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I try to do my best, you know, it's, you got to keep looking good and you put the filter on and people think you're 10 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is that button in there, enhance, isn't it? Enhance. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, Karen, can you, oh, Paula, can you show us what you're doing in your studio, please? I can. I'm not sure the, there's a, a photograph of mine. Um, you know, the whole online thing has, has gone so well the last few weeks. And then yesterday, I just had a complete internet outage. Uh, this morning, I was teaching piano from my kitchen. I've been banging a, an awful lot on work surfaces and trying to show hand positions and, and saying to my students, this is the only keyboard I've got, so <laughs> we're going to have to make the most of it. There's been a lot of that. But um, these days, I'm, I'm teaching from my home studio on my lovely grand piano. Um, when we all went online, I decided to keep it really super simple. Um, I think you can put a lot of money into devices and microphones and lighting. And like with Glory, that's something that you're doing all the time. But for me, I'm just really hoping it's not something I'm going to have to do forever. Um, I listened to a podcast by Tim Topham right at the beginning, and he said, it doesn't have to be complicated or sophisticated. And I decided that's how I'm going to be then. <laughs> so I just put my spare Mac computer <coughs> screen into my music room. Um, so I'm not squinting on an iPhone. Um, I was already using Zoom. And I just make sure I'm really organized. You know, I've got a, I've got a folder for every student with their, with their music copied. And I'd never done that before, but I think it's going to be useful even when students come back face to face, uh, you know, post coronavirus. Um, I think it'll be a, a useful resource uh, for students who forget their music or for when students don't don't arrive for their lesson and we have to make uh, a video for them or something. So um, so that's where I'm at. OK, terrific. What about Karen? Karen, can you show us through your studio and some of the tech you use? I have the very uncomplicated version. 
I have my little laptop sitting on a very old sewing table of my grandmother's and it's got wheels. So if I have to wheel it around to do guitar or violin, um, and then I just kind of swivel the laptop around to the piano when I need the piano keys. Mm -hmm. So one, one view, you don't do, you're not doing the whole, whole overhead camera thing. Nope. Nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've never done that. And like I said, I've been doing this a long, lot longer than this virus has been around. So. Yeah, yeah. And I know, I like your carpet there. I like nice big. Nice oh, carpet. it's beautiful. Yes. I have to roll it up on exam day because all the answers are on it. <laughs> <laughs> And you've been also um, doing theory via iPad too. Can you show us? Yeah, my students send me photos of just text them to me when they complete their theory. And then I just do that on my iPad with the iPad pen. Mm -hmm. And there's my beautiful artwork of smiley faces. And then I just text it back to the parents. It's kind of simple, but yeah. really good, isn't it? Well, it's all you do in lesson, isn't it? You don't only tick it in lesson, so... And are you using mic? Oh, we've had a we've got a question in from Christine, who said, "Are you using microphones or just the microphone in your laptop?" Just the laptop, absolutely nothing extra. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've even had students at the other end who are just using their iPhones, who it wouldn't stay up. So I told them to go to the kitchen and get a big fat glass tumbler. So that became the stand for the phone, mm. on the other end. <laughs> So many things. We are like Paula being very creative and having to improvise. We, we're mm. good at improvising in many different, we use this skill in many different ways, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to the questions for this week. Now, with the loosening of restrictions, we can start to contemplate some staging back face to face um, over the coming weeks or months. Um, Amy B in Queensland this, this week announced that they are uh, having a gradual return to exams in June and July. On this topic, Vanessa Munns asks, how are you planning on transitioning back to face-to-face -face lessons? I have some parents indicating they might want to stay online. How are you going to do this, Gloria? You're probably not going to do this until September, I guess. Well, um, for myself, um, I, my students actually really loved doing their online lessons. We had a lot of fun doing it, and we're going to be talking about some little tips to have some fun. But I think that I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing my students back in the studio because, of course, you miss the hugs and you miss the interaction and putting sticker in their books. Um, so we will be transitioning back into the, into the studio uh, in September. Uh, this is May, middle of May, and for us, this is the end of my, my teaching year. Uh, June, July, and August, I'm usually traveling, doing trade shows and workshops and presenting here and there. So I'm really looking forward to seeing them in the studio, but also I will be running a hybrid studio moving forward because there's, it's been so successful that I think it has great benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if somebody's sick or they can't make it to a lesson, they don't have to miss it because we can just jump on line. And I really agree with, um, you know, what Karen and, and Paula were saying. Um, my studio is not complicated. I mean, yes, I have a ring light and yes I have a microphone because I shoot a lot of videos so obviously I need that but I like to keep things super simple the kiss method right keep it super simple and just uh, have fun teaching that's really the the end result is you know are the students learning and are they motivated and are they having fun because that's what it's all about making music yeah absolutely and Karen what about you what systems are you going to be putting in place or well living in a country town with only 2,000 population um Quite a few of my students have remained face to face, mm -hmm. so I've got put in that studio there, so they can stay. Oh yeah, I've always had the setup. I'm at one piano and they're at the other. Mm -hmm. um, but the, just basic stuff like leaving the gate open so that they're not all touching the gate as they come in. Um, they are washing their hands on arrival. So I've got things that are already in place. But I'm thinking I'm just going to breeze through the rest of this term, mm -hmm. um, where people can start coming back if they want to. But next term, I'm going to have to maybe insist with some families because I think some of them are going to like not having to travel here because they come in from the farms. Yes. Um, and it's, I don't think this is a good long-term way mm. of teaching if I can go back to face-to-face because -to -face I love seeing the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's missing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Paula? Yeah, well, I intend to stay online this term, obviously with the hopes of returning to face-to-face -to -face teaching in term three. That's July for us here in Australia. You know, but I think it's really important that teachers evaluate the risks according to their individual circumstances. Mm. And I think where you live, for example, mm. 
is, you know, if you've only got 2,000 people in your town, um, as Karen said, um, for, for me in Toowoomba, we've got no active cases at the moment in Toowoomba, so I think the risk is quite low. Mm -hmm. But with restrictions easing, that could change, and I think we need to be very aware of that. Mm. It's, a moving, it's a moving target, isn't it? A moving minefield. It is. And, and I think it also teaches, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this too, you know, if you have health issues or you're in a high risk category in terms of age or some of your family are, then I think it's, um, it's important to consider that as well. Um, and also to look at your studio space. I've got a very small space in my in my room it's going to be very very difficult to practice social distancing mm -hmm. especially teaching an instrument like piano mm -hmm. um, and as we all know children have absolutely no filters at all when it comes to coughing and sneezing on you <laughs> <laughs> i think we need to think about that um, for me i um, i'm not going to transition in this in the sense of transitioning i think it's either going to be safe in my situation to do so or, or it won't and, and to answer Vanessa's question, I think she said something about some of her parents have indicated they might want to stay online. And, and I think, I think that's, that's fine as well. I think I'll respect that because they've got to consider their situation. So if in the short term, they would like to stay online. I'm happy to accommodate that. Mm. Uh, but let's face it, it's a compromise. Online teaching is a compromise um, for most of us. It is for me because I'm not really set up to teach that way. Um, so it, it, it would have to be a temporary thing. So I think my, my parents and my students would need to understand that long term, the, we, you know, the plan is to, to go back to face-to-face um, -to -face right. teaching. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, a few episodes ago, we showed a video of Diane Scott's uh, studio and the systems that she put in place for teaching safety, safely face-to-face. -face. While this virus is still around, uh, we could be teaching uh, a bit of a hybrid model. And there's some great ideas in here if you're thinking about staging back to face-to-face -face lessons. So we thought you might like to see it again. Hi, my name's Diane, and I'm a piano teacher in Druval, Queensland. Many of my students have a very poor internet connection, so I have set up a social distancing studio. My piano has the all their students work digitally filed and a boom and a side camera as well as the front camera of course and then over here once the children have gone and washed their hands and I've cleaned the piano they sit down to their own zoom meeting with me after they finish their lesson they sanitize their hands again and then they go out and parents help them get a chocolate chip cookie that I have made for them and they go home. I hope you like the tour of my studio. What a great studio Diane has. Well, if you want some help setting this kind of thing up, um, we have our Brave Cats, Cool Cats and Clever Cats page and a whole host of resources for you. I'm sure you've seen the teacher resource page for the brave cats, the cool cats and the clever cats with a whole heap of videos curated just for you. Since then we've received so many emails from teachers about how to communicate with our students as well as what games to play in this online teaching space. So we've created an online teaching resource kit. It's completely free. And the best bit is that you can send the kits to your students, so you both have them. Let me show you. The first thing I'm going to show you in the Teacher Resource Kit is the flashcard party with 64 flashcards for you to print out. We've made them in colour, but if you don't have a colour printer, we've also got black and white versions. There's note names, symbols, notation and rhythm. There's a one stave, two stave, six stave and 12 stave manuscript PDF for both A4 and US letter. Make your own paper keyboards, two octaves and then a two page, three octave keyboard. For online lesson or homework notes with your student, a template for Google's free docs service. The online lessons teacher resource kit is free to piano teachers who watch Q&A. We'll put the link in the show notes 
or just head over to pianoteachingsuccess.com. Gillian and I hope you find this really useful in your studio. Well, we'd like to know your thoughts about continuing with online lessons in your studio going forward. And we thought we might do something a little different. We haven't done this before, so let's hope it goes smoothly. Um, we're going to do a run a poll. Um, so, as I said, I don't know. Hopefully there's a button on your screen. Oh, yes, it's just come up. How will you be transitioning back to face-to-face -face lessons? So here's the poll and we, and we might just get you to, hopefully it's uh, something's come up, a little box come up on your screen and you can actually fill that in right now. So whilst we um, do this poll, we'd like, I'd like to get the panelists' thoughts on these questions. Um, what considerations are you looking, uh, looking at, particularly for the Australian ones with the winter colds and flu? Uh, what sort of systems are you going to put in place with that? And if you're going back to face-to-face -to -face and your own personal health and going, you know, ongoing use of online lessons, are you thinking about doing a hybrid yourself? Like, are you going to, yeah, what do you think? What are your thoughts? And including online lessons in your offering. Uh, Paula. I think I sort of covered um, a lot of that when I spoke a moment ago. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I'm really excited about is that I've been so stretched and challenged to, to bring my music teaching online. And a lot of those things I really want to keep, keep doing. You know, I've used a lot more online um, and, um, things. I think I'm going to talk about that in a moment, you know, like the lesson mate, um, if that's if that comes in. Um, yes, just, just means of communicating with students online. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess that's, that's sort of why I'm at. It's just how I'm going to be able to bring some of the, the online things that I'm currently doing that I will still, still do even when I get back to face to face. Hmm. The lesson mate thing, we'll, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that later, but that you showed us through that yesterday and it looks absolutely fabulous. I can understand why you want to keep that going. That's terrific. Um, Glory, what about you? Well, one of the things that I found that is interesting in my studio is that some students who, um, and we will be getting back into our, our studio lessons, but I have actually seen growth in some students that um, were maybe shy before and now they have uh, a different comfort level because they're at home. It is also given me an opportunity to see inside each one of my students' places. So they're playing on an out of tune piano. They are, their piano's in the basement. It's dark and scary down there. It, it is given me a chance to really get to know where the student practices. Maybe their piano is just sort of peeking between the living room and the kitchen. And so it's where, you know, the dad might be watching TV and the mom's making supper. And now this child is trying to practice and it's a really noisy space. So I think you know, the good that has come out of teaching online has given us an opportunity to take a sneak peek inside where our students are actually practicing. And it has given me personally a huge aha moment to understand at a deeper level why this student is not moving forward as quickly as they possibly could. So now when we get back to face-to-face -face lessons, and I have addressed many of these issues already with parents saying, when you have an opportunity to do so, please tune your piano. Um, maybe it would be better if you thought about moving your piano just maybe to the other side of the room so they're not in the kitchen. And so I really have found that it's been a massive opportunity to uh, have a little more insight into why my students, is, my students are doing so well because of the piano that they have at home and their practice schedule as well as those that don't do as well and, and those that have gained confidence because now they're in their comfort zone of being at home versus those that you know just want to come back into the studio because they want to play on the grand piano instead of the rickety one that's out of tune at home. So it's been an <laughs> eye-opener. It's been a true eye-opener for me. I think that's true. I think so yeah. many teachers have said the same thing. Karen, what about you? Can you ask the question again? I've forgotten it. <laughs> Well, it's really about how has this online, you know, um, just sort of questions and considerations and thoughts going forward. But I think oh, that, yeah. that was really what have you learned from this online? Because you've been teaching, were you teaching students online or more teachers online? Uh, students, because when I moved from Brisbane, some of my kids couldn't live without me. So we just, I said, well, you can go online. So we did. So I've been doing that for about five years. Right. So, 
And, and since this has happened and on Facebook, I put that I was doing online. I've had friends that have moved into state. I've had new students enroll. That's that fantastic. Will, you're permanently online. I've had two little boys from, from England that are about to start because their mother lived in Australia. So I will always have a studio that's a bit of both. Yes. But definitely once we get back to everyone face to face that wants to, um, if they're away sick and they are well enough to do a lesson, we can do this now. Yes. That's so right. So the options are there now. That require it's going to help that um, um, make up lesson request thing. Yeah, <laughs> go away. They, they can't come because the parents are away and the grandparents don't want to bring them up. Mm. And yeah, they right. can switch on a computer. So absolutely. Yeah, that'll be good. Well, we've had uh, we've got some uh, little polls in here. Fifty three percent return to both online and face to face. Majority of your people are returning in July. So that's, that's interesting to know. Yeah, so term three. Mm. Yep. Okay, well, we, if we have any more um, little insights, Paul, online teaching if the virus persists. Yeah. Yeah, so there's some of the, uh, well, it's definitely a safe option for all of us, isn't it? Okay, let's go into another question. Um, Courtney March Peach from Claremont has this question for the panel. Are the young student of five, that is extremely bright. She's flying through the Daniel McFarlane's method book one. However, she is a perfectionist. She will have a meltdown if she thinks something's not perfect, even if it is. How do I prevent her from developing anxiety disorder? <laughs> oh, firstly, let's talk about uh, some of these uh, ASD and uh, some of these disorders and things. Karen, could you talk to that about us? Well, ASD, just for those that aren't in with the lingo, is um, autis autism spectrum disorder. So it's about what level of autism or Asperger's is also included in this now um, that the children have. So you talk about sort of high functioning and all the different levels. But a student with anxiety like that, I tend to go for very small, even if you just work on bar one. And let's get bar one right. They need to have ongoing positive experiences and then bar two and then maybe do bar one and bar two and it really doesn't matter how far they get through it if you've got them in a positive um place mm. they will feel confident mm -hmm. also with recitals and performances if they don't want to perform my rule in the studio is they have to attend because that way they come they watch the other students and it becomes something familiar and i always say bring your music book with you in case you change your mind and then I'll just sneak over and whisper to them, you know, do you want to have a go? Sometimes they have a friend come and sit next to them. So there's, there's ways of working around it to make the child feel comfortable and have a go if they want to. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Glory, what about you? What do you have for those kids that are quite perfectionist orientated and... You know, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think I think one of the key, and I and I'm so grateful, um, Gillian, that you and Paul are doing this show because it really is an eye opener for many teachers that struggle with this. And I think one of the key factors, of course, is you know, um, if a child can't learn the way you teach, maybe you should teach the way the child learns. And for many of us, um, you know, such as Karen, she's sharing this. It's important for us to understand the the different learning styles visual auditory and kinesthetic but then it's also important for us to understand if a student is you know adhd maybe they need um you know they're frustrated or they need to stand up and march in place maybe need to add color to their music maybe you need to understand that they have a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset and how can you change that and take them from you know a fixed mindset of feeling that you know this is what i'm born with this is all that i know and they lose confidence you know if they think they failed versus a growth mindset which they feel confident in their abilities and they are proactive in learning and they know that it's despite making mistakes, they can master those challenges. And when you have these variety of students, it's no wonder we become counselors, right? <laughs> we have to constantly be working on professional development, which is one of the great things about the Piano Teaching Success TV series is that you are providing education. If you do have a child that has ADHD or you think maybe they do or, they, or you're not connecting with them, you need to reach out. 
you need to attend you know professional development workshops you need to listen to programs such as this with experts such as karen and paula to say oh i learned something today and then and then try those things with your students you know don't be afraid to try new things because if you just teach the way you always did you'll always get what you've always got which is the same result so step outside the box <laughs> that's what i have to do every day <laughs> Great, thank you, Glory. Paula, what do you do with kids that are kind of quite perfectionist and like to be fair? I know one, one child I had once, um, we got, she had gotten A plus for grade one, A plus for grade two, and she got an A for grade three. And I handed out, was in a class, handed out all of the, everybody's results and tears, tears. I said to the mother, what's going on? Oh, she's, she didn't get an A plus and she always gets an A plus. <laughs> but, the t but the examiner may not have handed out A pluses. It just depends on the examiner. You know, sometimes they don't. Oh, and so we had to kind of, you know, and she had not used to because she was really high level, very, very clever little girl. La, la, la. So what, what do you do with these kids that are like, have meltdowns if it doesn't, 100% perfect? Well, I must say it's much easier in a face-to-face -face lesson, isn't it, to cater for the emotional needs of a young student or, or any student. Um, I find that I have to be very vigilant at the moment teaching online to look for those signs of a student getting upset or ex expressing some sort of feelings. Um, it's Courtney that asks the question, isn't it? It's like she's very sensitive to the students. And I think that's at the core of this kind of issue. It's very important to build a relationship with every student. Um, so that we understand their individual needs because every student is different and some students we can throw anything at them and they just deliver and at the other end of the spectrum we're just walking on eggshells and that's the art of pedagogy. Uh, I, I do work with several gifted children and they, they can be very driven and easily become overwhelmed and we have to be careful that they don't burn out later on. So my advice when working with a little child like this would be just to take things really slowly um, even if the student wants to fly through the method book, you know, our job is to control the pace of our students' progress and ensure quality over quantity. So I'd be inclined not to actually physically give her her next tutor book, but purchase it on her behalf, on her behalf, keep it, and just copy pages of her book and give them to her each week so she can't race ahead. And this way we, we stay in control of that. Um, so just stay with the same repertoire, repertoire for a while, take small steps each week and, and help her to, to build on something that she's already mastered. And, and in the end, you know, as Gloria's saying, take time to smell the roses, just let her enjoy her music making. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Very, that's really helpful, Paula. Our next question comes from Heather from Shoalhaven Heads, and she asks about a student who is eight years old with Asperger's who last year very bravely overcame his fears and entered a music festival. He was first up in a totally strange for him environment and managed extraordinarily well, given he has booked two or three times at an ordinary in-house concert and at an assembly performances in his school. She, uh, Heather's planning a Zoom recital within her studio very soon, and she's wondering what steps can I take to encourage him to have the confidence to perform in public again, given that the first two occasions he did this were so successful. or whether in fact this is something that is not perceived as an achievement within his altered thought process and am I doing the right thing by keeping on encouraging him? Karen, what would you say? For I would that? definitely keep encouraging him, Hip. He's done a couple of performances already successfully. This is just another way of performing. I would personally do an individual Zoom meeting with him performing and set that up so he's had a go at it first. Yeah. With these students, yeah. it's about them feeling familiar. Mm -hmm. And I just think that will be the solution because if he's successfully performed before, you need to continue to encourage that. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I guess Heather may be worried that um, her student would be moving from the, a very familiar environment's environment into an unfamiliar one. So that's why it will be great to do that mm -hmm. little test up front. Um, yes. This fear of performing, though, isn't confined to children with ASD, is it? Oh, uh, many no. children and adults have a terrible fear of performing um, when they're not used to it. What do you do to help your students with this, Glory? 
Well, it's kind of a funny story because um, when I started teaching uh, and my daughter Sherry started performing and she started in music lessons when she was two and by the time she was five, she was already performing at recitals and programs and festivals and things. But what happened was she was actually very afraid, just like, you know, we've been talking about those, how do you build the confidence? And so what I did with her and subsequently I have done with many of my students that are nervous or shy, I literally have taken them with their parents to music stores. You know where you go to purchase a, your grand piano or, or any music stores, electronic pianos, whatever. And I just have them go uh, take their child every week and they go and play every single piano in the store and it has become something that now has become a habit. There's a lot of restaurants that might have a piano in them. I remember going shopping and there would just be a piano in the shopping mall and I would just encourage my students to go and play it. So it doesn't always have to be in that concert setting or in the recital setting. I think it's important to go and play on any and every piano you can find because they all have a different action. It's the thing about performing on a piano in particular, you know, when you're playing saxophone or guitar, well, of course, violin, you always bring your own instrument. And for some students, if you have, you know, a rickety old piano at home and now you see this huge concert grand, it's overwhelming and you have to get up on a stage. And so I think have fun with it. You know, go on, have a little notebook and say, how many pianos can you play this month? write them down. What color were they? What did they sound like? How did, how, were, how did the pedal feel? How was it different? How was it the same? Because then it becomes an adventure. And my students have had a lot of success by stepping out and playing many different pianos, whether it was at their friend's house or you know, going to a music store. But I think that really is important. Play every place you can find and play on every single piano you can find. And that will definitely help them gain confidence in not being afraid to approach any, no matter what it looks like. So take your notebook. How many pianos can you play in a week? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. I've never even thought about that. And I think also by doing that, you're actually taking the, um, the focus off on them it's all about me and what I sound like and rather than oh discover this piano what is it yes. like? and what does it feel and what is it you know you're sort of taking changing their mindset and their thoughts yes. on what they're doing yes absolutely and it's an adventure for them um you know there's a couple of restaurants that are are you know in the area and in here um, in Winnipeg Canada and they have a piano and they often have you know professional people that are there playing but they also allow uh, um, any student to go up and play providing that they're going to play a piece and not of course bang on the piano so many of my students have just gone in there and played and sometimes they've given them free dessert you know <laughs> and so it it really is it's a lot of fun and I often give my students little notebooks at the beginning of the year for for me here I start teaching in September and we try to fill our notebook with repertoire so that they can go out and play on these pianos wherever their great adventures take them. And they have a repertoire of maybe, you know, six or seven pieces. They can mix it up, maybe 10. And throughout the year, they're gaining confidence. And by the time they get to the exam, it's like, that's easy. <laughs> I do it every, I do that every weekend. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Karen also said that she find, tries to find venues where the, um, either one of those steep venues where the um, uh, perhaps the uh, stage is down, but, or perhaps there's a level venue where they're not up on this big platform. It's like, oh, a bit scary. So that's, that's a great advice, Karen. Paula, you've organized something very innovative around performance in your studio this weekend. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm very, quite excited about it, although it's been a huge amount of work. <laughs> um, we normally have the Toowoomba Stedford in May, and I have, I have about 40 students, and this, this year I entered um, 86 perf different performances. And so my, my students were going, to, were going to perform 86 times between them. And of course it got cancelled because of coronavirus. Uh, so it seemed such a shame that they'd put $660 money into entries. And so I just suggested to the parents and the students, how about we take that money and we, we do our own piano competition online. And we've called it the Ossias. Um, Ossia, as um, some uh, music, musicians will know, is, um, um, is an Italian term for an alternative 
part of the music. Uh, so it seems great, you know, it sounds a, a little bit like the Oscars too, doesn't it? The Oscars. <laughs> it does. <laughs> We're quite excited about that. Um, so we've made a really big thing of it. And the, the, the kids, are, obviously they've got to pre-record their pieces. And, and, and I think, you know, talking about what, what Gloria was saying, about how important it is to, to keep playing, this, this notion of setting up the camera and, and performing your piece on camera. Um, I had a student this morning who said, it took me 40 minutes to record one piece because I recorded it 20 times because they wanted to get the perfect, the best performance they could. And it occurs to me that I'm probably going to continue to get my students to video me one of their pieces every week. So that, and, and to do it at the very best they can. Because uh, last year I, I was involved in, um, in um, a recording studio. I accompanied an, a British singer. And we had two days while she cut the CD. Or, um, and when you first get into the recording studio, there's a lot going on there. And we, I found that I made a lot of mistakes, you know, but it was like, it took like a first hour just to get focused. And then we were fine for the, for the two days, you know. Um, so I, th I think using something modern like that and recording the pieces um, is very, very good, giving them a, a lot of uh, performance uh, practice. Mm -hmm. So th this Saturday and Sunday, I've got an adjudicator and we've got the sections, uh, six hours worth of competition. <laughs> oh, wow. Bigger than her. I had no idea how big it was going to be. Um, I had to photocopy 86 pieces and send them to the adjudicator. Um, it, it is quite big, but mm. I think Are one of the most- Are you broadcasting this to all of your students? Like, like on a Facebook, how are you doing that? Facebook Live? No, no. It it's all it's on Zoom and it'll all be very uh, protected, privacy protected and so on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this, it's just exciting. And um, I, I, I think it's just a, one, of, one of the very important things that I decided right at the beginning of going online teaching was that I needed to over deliver. You cannot under deliver at the moment. So, um, you know, I've been doing some, some innovative things, some things that I haven't done before, really just to make sure I'm over delivering. And, and it sounds like everybody is, you know, the, the ideas and the innovative things that everyone's doing is mind boggling. And in many ways, this period of time, I think has been a gift to teacher development and for sharing of, of ideas. Um, I don't know if you've got time, but I'll just talk very briefly about lesson mate. Love you too. Like, yeah. um, it's, um, it's, um, this, I don't know if Paul's got any pictures of it, um, but most of my young students were sort of starting to go a little bit stir crazy at home. So I thought it'd be fun to offer them some extracurricular music activities, you know, things that we don't always have time to do. I wanted to do some activity sheets some musical word searches, like have a, have a composer of the week with a fun featured work and then have a quiz on it, um, theory challenges or introduce them to, um, to a, a concert pianist once a week like Lang Lang. But it really took me a while to find a platform that would support this, that would look professional. And I came across LessonMate. So it's LessonMate.org. It's designed for music teachers to, to make up, um, for, for use for missed and make, make up lessons. So if a student cancels a lesson, you can, you can prepare a lesson on this, um, on this, this portal. Um, but I've used it, as you can, can see, um, it, 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 just get on and have a look at it. Um, it's very, very professional. It looks great when they receive their email. They, they click on it and you, you, can, you can upload everything from YouTube videos. And so anyway, something for people to have a little look at. I think it embeds the video too, doesn't it, in the email? It, does. it embeds a YouTube video. So it does look, it looks really professional. Mm. And, um, I've had such amazing feedback. One of the things I, I did with my, my little ones, we, we had the Flight of the Bumblebee. So Rimsky-Korsakov was our, was our composer of the week. And then we had a little, a little word search on Rimsky-Korsakov, which is quite hard to find if you're six or seven. And then I... I, 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 <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I that's the one, yeah. Um, and then I, I, in, I included um, a, a colouring picture of a bee. And they had to see if they could colour in the bee before 
the piece of music, the flight of the bumblebee was over. And people <laughs> sent me photographs of it. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> we've had a heap of, but, it, um, but, but there's some beautiful music out there. And I, I think a lot of my piano students, they, we, we, we can tend so easily to become very focused on exam pieces and just them playing. And there's a whole world of music out there with, with pianists and, and, and periods of music and, and the fact that they're listening and, and learning. So I've had a lot of fun doing it. And I think I will continue to do it. Maybe not every week, but perhaps a once a month uh, lesson mate activity with listening and um, other, other activities in it for my students. That's great. And I think that's part of this, you know, we've got these tech savvy kids, the kids of today. And uh, many uh, teachers have said, oh gosh, you know, they were uh, getting set up at home. The kids were fine. They just got it all set up. They were even better than the parents. And they're just so quick with all the tech, right? So if we are trying to reach our students of today and they're really tech savvy, this is great to conclude these kinds of um, programs and, and uh, as an ongoing basis. Now that we've, now that we've actually had to man up, <laughs> And do it. <laughs> We've got the skills now. It's good to continue. Yeah. Well, Paul is going to share the, uh, sharing the results of the poll. So hopefully you can see it on your screen. I can see it on mine. Let us know if you can. Um, so we've got, so there's three questions in there. You just have to scroll down to see the answers. So number one, slowly returning both to uh, both online and face to face. What do you do to envisage your timing? Most people are saying July, someone doing it now in June. Let's, yes. And then I will teach online if the virus persists, most of them. Um, less than replacement, 28%. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting to look at. Thank you. And if you are joining us not live, you won't have seen this poll. So, but we will put a, um, a survey in there so you can actually participate in this as well. Let's go on to our next question. Margaret Jackman from Coburn has this question for Karen. We've got lots of questions for Karen today because I knew, oh, ASD, right, let's ask all our questions. <laughs> so thank you for being here, Karen. Um, um, I teach an 11 year old boy who is practicing this year for grade three piano, classical. I have taught him for two years and he now appears to have become disinterested in his music. And as his mother always sits in on the lessons, he constantly leaves the piano to hug her, which she refers him back to the piano. He has been assessed for autism, but apparently is clear of this. I am reluctant to restart him into online lessons for fear he will waste time leaving the screen as he used to, he's used to one-to-one -to -one teaching. What should I do here, Karen? I have... Um, with some of my ASD kids had to go to instead of a 30 minute le lesson once a week move to two 15 minute lessons a week because they can focus easier for a shorter amount of time so I've, that's worked very successfully in my studio um, you usually end up with them getting about 20 minutes but you know that's okay but I, I do a lot of working with the parents too and asking the parents about their children if you learn from the parents um, because each one of these children, like every child we teach, is in, an individual. Mm. So I'd be talking with the parent if, that, if they felt that would help by two lessons a week. I'm kind of feeling that maybe not having the parent around would help. Mm. Because if he's going over to, and hugging and being distracted by the parent, if you remove a distraction, but then you've got to make sure the parent's comfortable with that. Mm. Well, too. wouldn't it be worthwhile putting, um, asking the parent to sit beside him on the piano still? So then they've got that emotional support of the parent. Well, yeah, that would help too, because then you've got the parent closer. You're not losing all that time if they're ducking over to the couch. <laughs> <laughs> and they are used to you sitting right next to them at the piano. So mm. it's, keeping, it's keeping everything as familiar as we can in a different circumstance. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, so uh, Margaret's online actually, and she says, uh, he is better when his mother leaves the room on her phone. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say I'd accidentally ring the mother. <laughs> you could set that up. But yeah, I, it's, it's about with these children, their focus is lost so easily. So it's about having as least amount of distractions as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely try the two, the two smaller lessons a week. Mm, that's a good idea. 
And even if you um, are teared up with the mother that um, let's try this, but if it lasts five minutes, let's just do five minutes. Yeah, that's right. Let's just do that. You know, let's yeah. just see how we go. And as soon as I feel as though it's not being productive, let's just end it. So we just have a positive experience. Do, is that? Is that yes, right? definitely. Or if you're also doing theory, I even are getting the kids to just sit and do some theory writing while I'm there online with them. Because mm. they're just loving the company of somebody else at the moment. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So if you can. I know towards the end is a lesson with all students, really, <laughs> concentration flags. A little, and our challenge is really to kind of keep the energy up from week to week in, in the lesson, from lesson to, in each lesson, and also from really week to week as we're going through this. So I thought I'd ask our panel what they are doing with their students to liven up lessons and keep their students focused and lessons fun. So, Glory, would you like to go? You've put together a bit of a list. Um, I so do. Can you go through the list? Paul's got some little slides to help. He does. Thank you, Paul. Uh, So here's my top 10 list for uh, some fun ideas to keep your students engaged. The first one is bring your pet. Um, Now, if they don't have a pet, then I just asked them to bring their favorite stuffy, but it's been a big hit because their pets are always kind of walking through the room anyway, so we get to meet their pet. So that's kind of a fun thing. Bring your pet or your favorite stuffed animal if you don't have a pet. Uh, The second one is a costume party. And so I always say dress up in a silly hat or a little outfit, or you can even just wear makeup. One of my um, little girls, she actually drew a little mustache on with some eyeliner. So it's just kind of a a quick and easy fun thing. Uh, Number three is to change your accent. So if you want to be speaking with a British accent or a French accent, if you can do one, or a Southern accent, if you got one of them up your sleeve or you, 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 you just want to do a, bitty, 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 a cartoon, <laughs> that's the best I could do. <laughs> ah, those are fun. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I can't do that one. <laughs> so number four is story time. And I ask my students to write um, a story using Italian and musical terms to describe the event. So my bunny is staccato and moving allegro across the backyard. So that's kind of a little, little story. Number five is to do an online performance. And I make sure that they need to dress up fancy. And this is gonna be their online. And so it'll just be, you know, we can record it of course, and then I can just put it up on YouTube and they can watch it later. So just, it doesn't have to be a recital. It's just a performance. So number six is fun. This is backwards day. Oh, I like the button Paul has there. I was wondering what he was gonna come up with. So on backwards day, my students wear their clothes backwards. So you put on your suit jacket backwards. You put on your hoodie with the hood in the front. And of course, if you put it up, you're covering your face. But I also reverse the order of my lesson plan. So instead of starting with your technique, and then you go through your studies, and then your pieces, and then you end with, you know, your jazz or pop or whatever it is that you're doing, you do the lesson backwards. And when they come into the lesson, you say, goodbye, And then you start the lesson. (laughs) And at the end of the lesson, you do what you normally do at the beginning, which is maybe your technique. And then you say hello, and then you hang up. So it's just kind of fun. Uh, Number seven is compose. And so in this one, the student is going to compose a composition to play for you in a week. And I usually just tell them to do it freestyle, make it fun, write it down if you want to, or just play it from memory. But it's entirely up to you. Make up words, whatever you want to do. Or you can even improvise on maybe a a piece that's kind of familiar and you're just going to change it up or change major to minor but just have fun but be creative that is the whole point number eight is make an instrument now I actually just did this with my student just before I jumped on the call with you uh, Gillian so uh, she took two paper plates and just put some beads inside and stapled the, pa- the outside of the paper plates. And so she made a little tambourine. And then we played rhythm patterns. And it's just really fun, again, just a little crafty thing. Uh, number nine is share your screen. And in the um, free resources for ultimatemusictheory.com, we have all music history videos that are applicable to each one of the levels, level one through level eight in the Ultimate Music Theory Workbook. So you can just make popcorn and watch a movie together. And you can also do this on Zoom. You simply share your uh, computer screen audio and it works fantastic. And the last one, it's one of my favorites. It is Musical Joke Day. 
and I have a joke for you, Miss Gillian. So I asked students to bring a joke uh, to class and we of course laugh out loud. So here is my joke to all of you. And it's even more fun if you can make it a musical joke. So here's my joke. What is Beethoven's favorite fruit? Would you like the answer? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The answer is banana. Uh. <laughs> That's great. Those are some fantastic ideas there, Glory. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, that's great. And Paula, you're well known in Delcro circles for embracing movement as part of your teaching process. I guess it's a bit hard in an online environment. What are you doing to kind of keep their attention and that? Yeah, it's been a bit frustrating for me. Um, you know, I feel at the moment like I've got my, my computer and my piano. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm actually teaching like in a caravan. You know, you can... <laughs> everything you know the cupboards the doors you know <laughs> the front door so it feels a bit like that which is really hard for a Dalcros person like myself who's very kinesthetic but there are still things that you can do and the children are used to me so there's 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 times that I'll, I'll just say to them come on get up and just just walk with your music and feel the beat and I'm, I'm watching them as they as they're going on the screen you know our noses are like this uh, so there are still things we can do, um, embracing that movement. I think for me as a teacher, it's been good because I've had to focus much more on my own visual auditory mm -hmm. systems of teaching um, because I always fall back onto kinesthesia because it's what I understand. You know, Jacques Delcroix said that every musical problem starts in the body and can be solved by the body. So imagine a student who, who can't keep the beat. You know, we, we might put a metronome on, but that's inherently auditory. Mm. It's, it's not tapping into the kinesthetic sense. And, um, you know, a, when we think of a beat, when we, when we tap a beat like this, if we clap like this, it stops. But that doesn't tell us the space between that and the next beat. And so it's really important that students get up and walk and have the, as they step, they're feeling the space between each beat. Um, and so, so there's so many things that you can still do. You don't need a lot of space with just one person to conduct a Del Crows class. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I take my children, students, when they come here into the kitchen, and sometimes I just open the door and we walk out on the lawn, take their music with them, and we just run for phrases and get a scarf. And so it's not possible to do all those things at the moment, but, but certainly there are still some things you can do. Well, I think your students are going to be really looking forward to getting back to doing all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, Karen, what secret tips do you have for us to keep your students' attention towards the end of the lessons? Well, my other thing is um, I'm very back into the Kodai training and a lot of singing. So, like, I use the Music for Little Mozart's program where we do little finger songs and we're still doing all of those things. Um, and particularly with the ASD kids, if I do some of the songs and little games to start, I grab their attention and their focus. So, so that's really helping. And I also use the Alfred's books where they have the um, activity book with the ear training. So we're still doing all of that. It's not just sit on the bench play all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's keeping activities that I normal in my studio still happening wherever possible. Yeah, that's some really great advice. Definitely. Well, thank you. Um, and Gloria, you've got a free gift for us today. It's a free music uh, teacher masterclass webinar where um, we, you're going to show teachers how to teach music theory online using Zoom. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Thank you, Glory. Thank you. And, um, and that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank Gloria St. Germain, Karen Eastman and Paula Melville Clark for being with us today. And next week, we have another amazing panel for you, including Sarah Campbell, who's well known for her work as an upbeat piano teacher. And Sarah is also a piano and voice teacher and business coach uh, for music school owners. And Sarah will be joining us from uh, New York, uh, the, oh, actually Middlesex, Pennsylvania, which is on the east coast of the USA. So she'll be staying up late like, late, like Glory has done today. Um, Susan Head is a pianist, uh, performance coach and piano teacher, accredited offshore work teacher. And she's taught a lot of whole body movement workshops with Paul at the Sydney Conservatorium. So we're I'm looking forward to having Susan and Vanessa Mons, who lives in, uh, an, in the West Australian Wheatbelt. 
to about three hours drive from Perth, where we're joining us with the good graces of unstable internet, which Paula, you've been doing, doing well, very well with today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in the meantime, keep those questions rolling in for us. Um, and I'd like to thank Paul Mart, who's been producing today's show and is responsible for all the videos and behind the scenes tech. On behalf of all of us, stay well and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye.